Right, I've got here. Hello, everyone. Well, what, what a great pleasure it is to be here, of course, among so many friends, um, both here in the auditorium and, of course, in the exhibition itself, where, uh, although I haven't seen all the swords before, I'm familiar with many of them, uh, although th there are um, some which um, I've been lusting after for many, many years indeed. <laughs> now, this is an exhibition, of course, of the arms and armor of the samurai, or the art of the samurai. Now, my dear friend, Mr. Ogawa, has stressed to me very, very strongly that samurai art is so important because it is the exterior art of Japan during the age of government by the samurai, as compared with interior art, that is, for example, ceramics, all the wares of the tea ceremony, um, paintings which are hung inside for your personal enjoyment, um, lacquer wares, and so on and so forth. So this, arms and armor, is in fact the face of Japan throughout the thousand years or so of the period of this exhibition. I want to talk about um, several aspects of the sword, because I regard the sword as being um, a measure, if you like, of the whole of Japanese culture. And I see in the sword itself the secret of the essence of Japanese genius for industry and the Japanese aesthetic itself. Well, this is a convenient place to start to talk about the slides, because the armor, of course, is an external piece of equipment. And in the case of this armor, there is no man inside it. Um, in fact, the armor itself is very, very pretty. Um, as you will see, it's an 18th century armor. And as uh, art and crafts in the Edo period in general, from 1600 to 1868, the end of rule by the samurai in Japan, um, the popular culture, a popular culture emerged in which decoration played an increasingly great role in society. You know what I'm talking about, the period of the, the, um, the flowering of the no theater, the ukiyo-e um, prints, and the great screen paintings in the castles and mansions of Japan, and of course, very decorative armor. The point about Japanese art is, of course, that it's so very, very Japanese. And also it is of a very enduring nature. Uh, there is change in the art of the samurai over a thousand years, but it's not immediately evident what the changes are. The armor itself, you see, changes very little from the ar armor that we saw earlier. On, on, the, on the screen with the large shoulder guards and the large skirt suitable for um, horseback co combat. And this is in fact a kind of a version of that early armor um, with a particularly interesting decoration here, the so-called tatewaku design. Do you see this um, undulating line with undulating colors? It's a very much a design that was used on Japanese kimono at the same time as this armor was made. In fact, when I said that um, this uh, armor has no man inside it, it's hardly surprising because it was in fact made for Yoneko, the wife of the daimyo Ikeda Harumasa of Bizen. And it has a very charming um, feminine aspect to it, do not see apart from perhaps the bristling moustache here. <laughs> well, it's the second time of seeing this sword tonight. Um, it, it was made, I think, in, it was given in 1618 to Tokugawa Yoshinao by the Asano family on the occasion of their dear daughter, Haruhime, to the um, uh, Tokugawa prince himself. And uh, as, as you see, it is uh, lack of beauty back, lacquered beautifully in gold lacquer and uh, with um, uh, lines picked out here in, in applied lacquer, the triple holly hock leaf mon, which is the badge of the ruling Tokugawa family, and a precious stones inset. Um, this is a particularly um, exotic um, sword fitting, if you like, and would have been used by the um, Tokugawa, who, although he was a military man, was an official at court. So it would have been used for his formal 
um, where at court. Well, the talk is actually about the Japanese sword, and this is a Japanese sword blade. A blade such as this would be inserted into a mountain such as the one that we saw in the last slide. So the hilt, the hilt fits over the tang here of the blade. There it is on, at the end of the long blade. The hilt fits over the tang, and the whole of the blade can be inserted into a, a scabbard, a decorative scabbard, perhaps, or a plain black lacquered scabbard. Now, I find there are, there are five aspects to the Japanese sword which I regard as interesting, but they're so exquisitely and irrevocably interlinked that we can't really talk about one without bringing in all of the other. But to define them, then, as much as I'm able to possibly, first, it's the sword as a, as a weapon itself. And as a weapon, it is an example of extremely fine and high technology. Secondly, it is a measure of Japanese history, because for the thousand years of the period we're talking about, the Japanese swords were very often signed by the makers and very often inscribed by the name of the province in which they were made and the date of manufacture. So the minute changes in curvature, length, and blade texture, which occurred over the ages, are, uh, can be related directly through these inscriptions to the date that the sword was made. A very few other art or craft objects to which that can be applied with such rigor as it can with the Japanese sword. Thirdly, the Japanese sword as a holy object in its own right. Well, I think perhaps all objects made by man are holy objects in their own right. But in um, medieval Japan, certainly, uh, the fact was hammered home. Um, sorry, that wasn't meant to be a pun, but it was quite a, quite a good one, I, I think. <laughs> Just excuse me while I obtain some water. <coughs> Fourthly, as an art object, perhaps the Japanese sword is the only object which is made of steel, which has an intrinsic beauty in its finely polished surface. And fifthly, no, by no means last, of course, fifthly, it is, in a way, an object of enlightenment through the practice of Japanese swordplay. The swords themselves, as I'm sure you all know, are made by a process of repeatedly folding a hot billet of steel and beating the, the sword out into a, the shape of a blade, covering it with a slurry of clay and other materials, which, when dried, is scraped off along the cutting edge. The whole is then heated red and plunged into water, thus preferentially hardening the cutting edge while leaving the body of the blade strong and resilient so that it can withstand the shock of combat um, when, for example, um, uh, fighting someone with, with wearing armour. The, when the blade is highly polished, the hard, hard edge, the crystalline structure of the hard edge, the martensitic structure, very hard, as hard as any tool steel um, of the Industrial Revolution, for example, it shows up as this white, frosty line of crystals in each individually visible to the naked eye or uh, visible only as a kind of a smoky hanging along the edge of the blade. This is known as the hamon, the badge of the blade. And it is the hamon that tells us very frequently, if not the maker, at least the school and province um, where the, school, the, the sword was made. On the body of the blade, that is between the hamon here and the ridge which defines the back of the blade to the triangular section, the cutting section, along the body of the blade, one can see the grain structure in the steel, which is brought about by the folding process. So in these facets and in the elegant curve of the sword, the elegant curve of the sword, the colors and textures and the grain of the, the body of the sword, and of course, the beautiful texture and movement in the hamon, we see a beauty. And this was defined in Japan a thousand years ago. 
uh, such that the Engishki itself, it's an uh, early 10th century um, document, speaks of the stages of revealing the beauty in a Japanese sword. The uh, living national treasure, Mr. Gasan Sadatoshi, here, with his assistant Hammerman here, is shown by his forge, um, forging a sword on an anvil here. Um, the billet, which is this white glowing piece, has been heated in the charcoal fire here, and between them, they hammer it out, fold it, and hammer it out into the final stage of um, manufacture. So this um, manufacturing of the Japanese sword is done in a very holy manner. It's not just a matter of acquiring iron, folding it and welding it together and beating it out to make a weapon. It's a matter of getting up in the morning, bathing yourself, using a bit of salt to purify yourself maybe, if it's necessary, and then maybe praying to the deity of your own forge or the deity that you would like to invoke to help you make the sword, and then approaching the work with respect for the material, a respect for the tradition um, by which the sword was made, and a respect, of course, for the forge itself and the fire in the forge. Um, the material itself is very interesting because the material is a special kind of iron. It is sand iron, or satetsu, and it is iron which is washed down from mountains along rivers towards the sea. The most important source of iron is that found in um, Shimane Prefecture in the north side of Japan, or uh, Izumo Prefecture, uh, or, or the country of Izumo, I mean, um, in olden times. Oh, there is a very interesting Japanese legend in the creation myth about Susanoo no Mikoto, the uh, brother of the sun deity, the sun goddess, who is enshrined at Ise. And he uh, overcame a tremendous dragon called the Yamata no Orochi, which is described in the 8th century myths as a huge dragon extending for a great long distance. And along its back there are fir trees, and it, it writhes red with uh, white uh, specks. Well, if you go to the, uh, the, 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 the river, the main river that flows through Shimane, you can see this dragon. The river is like a dragon. It splashes and rages, and it is running red, even today, with iron ore. When he defeated the Yamata no Orochi, he discovered a, a sword in its tail. And that is where the tale, I think, begins. Every year, uh, traditional style iron is made in Shimane in remembrance of those early days when the dragon gave up its secret sword. And this shows uh, the, uh, the so-called Tatara, a furnace where iron is uh, puddled over a two or three days period and made into a high refinement. The, uh, this is the final iron being broken up into pieces, the final wadge of iron. And to make this is also a holy process, and the workers, the, the hereditary workers who build the Tatara, spend some months, I think, preparing the ground. The ground around the furnace has to be dried and warmed in preparation for the manufacture of the furnace, which is built above ground out of clay. The details uh, are, 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 are too long and, uh, to discuss here. But this shows uh, some of the workers in the annual refinery um, paying their respects to the deity of the refinery itself. Well, um, I, I, I don't mind overstating the case. If you, I, know, I know that some of you have homes to go to, so if you want, you can leave any time you like, and I will not be uh, at all abashed by it. But this Shinto priest is at the essence of uh, pr production of swords and everything else in Japan. All the precepts of Shinto, cleanliness, respect for materials, and the tradition built up over hundreds and hundreds of years. These are the very aspects of the Japanese culture which are their genius for industry. Nowadays, we've all learned throughout the world from the Japanese, but certainly when I started, or 40-something 40, 40 years ago, uh, the Japanese had the best 
and cleanest factories. It was a cleanliness. This is why they're superconductor industries, their um, uh, motor car industries, their pharmaceutical industries have given so much to the world. This sword is known as the Sui Liu Ken uh, Water Dragon Sword. It was one of uh, 45, I think, or so swords which were um, entrusted into the Shosuin, which is a repository for the um, care of the effects of the Emperor Shomu, who died in uh, 758, I think, um, AD. Um, it's a wonderful building, and, and it's a log cabin, effectively, but very, very big indeed. And according to the season, the uh, wood um, expands and hermetically seals um, the uh, contents against extremes of change in humidity. The woods and so on, which are used in the Shosuin, uh, likewise are um, inducive to preservation of material. So in the Shosuin, there are, from the 8th century, silks from all the countries of the Silk Road, uh, s s curly slippers like those that Aladdin might wear. There are beautiful musical instruments of Tang Dynasty China inlaid with uh, precious stones and ivories and shell in pristine condition and swords like this, which was taken from the Shosuin um, uh, in, in 1873, I think, by the Emperor Meiji, and he had this uh, koshirai, this mounting made for it, with dragons um, uh, carved in gold and inset into the hilt. Uh, where are they? Here, the, the hilt is shown here with the dragons among waves. It harks back a bit, I think, to the creation myth and the discovery of the first Japanese sword in the tale of the river dragon. And the sword was mounted by a man named Kano Natsuo, who went on to become professor of the Department of Metalwork in what is today the University of Fine Arts and Music in Japan. This shows Kano Natsuo and before the restoration in 1868, admiring a sword mounting that he'd made for the emperor in Kyoto. And of, uh, as we have just seen, he was able to make another mounting for a different emperor in Edo or Tokyo. So, we have swords like the Sui Liu Ken, made in Chinese style, as were, was originally introduced into Japan around the 3rd or 4th century AD. And these were made for several hundred years. For example, the Sui Liu Ken was made in the uh, 8th century until sometime around the 10th or 11th century. Throughout Japan, the swords all became curved into swords like this by Yasutsuma of Hoki province, present-day Totori prefecture, which is believed to have been made in the 11th century and it is the most classic and beautiful example of the swordsmith's art. I think you can see, back a bit, I think you can see here, um, on the body of the blade, something of the graining with the various different colors of steel how can steel have different colours? Well, it does. It has colours and textures, and it has a depth too, so that some of the, 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 the steel might be described as moist or limpid or bright or energetic or relaxed. Um, but anyway, you'll be able to examine swords in the exhibition with a variety of different shapes and uh, textures to the, um, to the steel here. And the hammer here on these early swords was not contrived, it just occurred naturally. This is a bit of an enlargement of the same sword, and you can see very well here um, a kind of a, a flowing lines of a wood grain, kind of a grain-like wood. And if you look at this piece here, please, there's a white line like a parabola, and behind it there's a dark line here. So if you look carefully at this, the, these swords, obtain the reflection of light in the blades, you'll be able to see these metallurgical details. And the hum on here, you see, is not very clearly defined. 
Well, as I had said, um, the, the study of swords since the Engishki recorded it in the early 10th century has been recorded in Japan. And the re recording is done in this manner. Um, this is a cross section of a blade. That is the back of the blade. Uh, and this is the cutting edge of the blade. And this is the hamon, which has been drawn on in pencil. And this is how it was done in the past, of course, by ink and brush. So you can see here the wild nature of the hamon. The hamon, although in later days it became contrived by each smith into a particular pattern or shape, in the early days came naturally out of the need to make a very fine uh, weapon. You see, due to the uh, folding uh, process, you get a migration of iron, during the, uh, of carbon rather, across the various boundaries in the welding of, of, of the uh, layers of the laminate together. So um, when the heat treating is done, this uh, variation in carbon content and the variation in the, uh, the flow of the laminate, laminate, laminate itself leads to these kind of uh, expressive structures. So, of course, for the Japanese a thousand years ago, this was something wonderful and holy. It didn't come from man, it came from God. In it, there are because it's natural, of course, um, the, the um, sword, these various aspects of the sword are described using um, natural words. For example, um, this might be described as uh, sunagashi or um, flow of sand. Um, what this wildness here, or midari, is turbulence, uh, like a turbulent sea. And there are various little flakes separated from the hamon here, which have other names in nature. Or inside the hamon, there are little spots known as yo or leaves. It's natural that should, this should be so, because, uh, oh, and this is an, a nicer photograph of a, of a hamon, showing um, a, an early hamon, which although the maker had probably decided that he wanted this kind of um, effect, it still owes very, very much to the, um, to the work of nature in the kiln. And if I can draw your attention here to uh, drifting sand along, along a, 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 a beach as the sea comes in, uh, we will see why the Japanese um, look uh, for um, the, the, the actions of nature within their blades. And, of course, on a cloudy sky, you can see exactly the same kind of effect. It is quite natural. These are the laws of the universe, the laws of mathematics. Man himself did not invent metallurgy. It existed. It exists in the steel. It exists in temperatures. It, e it exists. The same effects exist, of course, up in the sky. They exist in the profile of distant mountain ranges. They exist in the way that lava cascades and sets down volcanoes. They exist in the patterns in snowdrops and the, the colors of dew on grasses. And this shows here uh, an, appro an approaching breaker, waves of the sea or uh, those of you who are sword aficionados will say, oh yes, that is the hamon of the Ichimonji school in the 13th century. I couldn't draw it better than uh, the gods uh, themselves. Uh, here's another um, picture of a sword which shows the same kind of effect, um, a wave, a violent wave, wavy sea. And I'm quite pleased with this picture, which I think I, I took the photograph from a book, and there's a reflection of my hand there, which well, adds a bit of colour to it, I think. And, um, so it, it is an undulating sea, and this show, the, 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 uh, the activity within the, the uh, hard part of the blade itself give a three-dimensionality to it. Um, these are a number of specialist photographs
taken by Ms. Fujishiro, I believe, which show a range of different kinds of hamons. So you can look for these in the exhibition and see how many you spot and indeed how many more there are to be seen. Now this aspect of um, Japanese art, which is a respect for nature, is something which appeared um, to the Japanese swordsmiths only by dint of the optimum blow possible with a hammer before the carbon migrates through the sword and the sword becomes useless. That optimum blow has to be the optimum blow commensurate with the manufacture of a perfect sword. The temperature of the uh, quenching also has to be a perfect temperature, otherwise the sword might crack or it might become soft. And so it was with ceramics. You know, 120 years or so ago, when Japanese art and crafts first came to the West, after the end of samurai rule, oh, oh what do you think the West thought about, uh, back, about pots like this, with uh, natural glaze running in all directions and apparently crudely made by hand? Well, I remember, I think, yes. I don't think the Westerns appreciated it very much. I thought they thought they were rather badly made. But today, if you go to any school of pottery in any country in the world, you will find every young student is desperate to acquire the skill to make an accidental pot like this. When I say accidental pot, this pot was, is so very, very highly regarded. And you see the way the glaze um, uh, runs diagonally from right to left because of the maelstrom within the furnace, or the gods, if you like, within the furnace, who splattered uh, glassified material from the walls of the furnace over the pot. And then at some stage, it became so violent inside the furnace, the pot was turned around, and the glaze started running upstream around in circles. So that's why it's highly regarded. This is a 15th century pot, but the same uh, concept, I think, has been guarded throughout Japanese history from the accidental glaze from the roof of, this, of the kiln in this 9th century Sanage ware pot, which just dripped down the side. This effect was regarded as very pleasing in the 9th century. This was regarded very pleasing in the 14th and 15th century, and it's still regarded as very pleasing today. And the same kind of work is put into the preparation of the material as is put into the preparation of the material for the manufacture of Japanese swords. I was uh, privileged once to go to visit the, um, the, uh, the, the um, f studio, that's the word, not factory, the studio of a living national treasure um, uh, potter. And he said, come and see my clay. And I thought, well, that would be very interesting, I'm sure. Um, I, sh I should have been more humble, yes. because stretching back into the distance, there was a lean-to roof, and underneath it, packets like this, well, slabs of clay, receding you know, for many tens of yards. And he said, um, um, most of this was put down by my grandfather. Well, the clay has got to be out of the ground for a hundred years before you can make pots with it. Well, um, this is a, 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 pit, a photograph of a sword presented the way we do in textbooks on swords, so, uh, so that you don't become confused. I'll show you what's happening here. What is happening is that this is a picture of the whole blade on the right. This next pair of swords is the same blade, one face of it and the other face of it. And this picture is, again, the same blade with um, uh, showing the, the details of the tang. Now, this is one of the long swords of the 14th century, which became too long for use and was cut down um, by um, shorter samurai, perhaps, for, um, for, uh, for convenience. And on, on it, it's a very important sword indeed. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I might be sounding light-hearted throughout this, but I'm very respectful for these swords. 34 national treasures and 64 important cultural objects. 
You know, the system in Japan is to grade things according to their excellence. And so swords are graded in a number of grades before they get to the government grades. And then they are important cultural object, important art object, and a national treasure. So there are maybe six or something, or seven grades of sword before you get to national treasure. Well, this is one. The, um, this is known as the Nakatsukasu um, Masamune, made by the man who's considered the greatest ever of Japanese swordsmiths in the early 14th century, Goron Nudo Masamune. At the, um, the blade has been cut down, and an attribution here in gold inlaid has been written, Masamune, and below that, Honnami, the family of sword appraisers and sword, cut, uh, and sword shorteners. And the name here of the, um, of the name of the sword itself, uh, Nakatsukasu um, Masamune, because it was owned by Honda Nakatsukasu. Um, a 17th century book tells us that the gold inlay was um, written or was made by um, Umitada Josai in 1606 from the Umitada family of, of metal workers. Um, now, the Honnami family throughout the Ashikaga period and into the Edo period, as for several hundred years, uh, provided advice on swords, uh, they cut down swords, um, the, the inscribed results of sword tests, and, and so on, on the tangs of swords. And in the early Edo period, the most famous of these, um, many of you will know of Honnami Koetsu, uh, who made these two wonderful pots in the early 17th century. And he was, of course, uh, very close to uh, the, ma uh, the, the, the man who established the raku um, uh, style of, of pottery making. So Honnami was primarily a sword connoisseur and his knowledge of sword connoisseurships took him into other further and further um, fields of Japanese arts and crafts. Now, I see that I've, I'm, I'm going to be hurried along in a minute, aren't I? This is the island of Okinoshima. And Okinoshima was on the way between um, Japan and Korea and China. So from the past, oh, 5,000 years ago in the Jomon period, People who traveled, those intrepid German period, sailors with their rowing boats, all the way from Japan to China and back, would deposit um, objects on this island. The island itself is regarded as holy and comes under the auspices of the Munakata Taisha Shrine on the mainland. And in it um, uh, grew up the, the custom from the Kofun period, that's a period of ancient graves, uh, fourth to seventh centuries, up to the early Heian period, uh, from the eighth or ninth century or so, the custom of leaving offerings to the deity of the island. And the point of it all is, this is one of those offerings. Um, the, the date I'm not sure of, but I believe it is late, late Kofun or early Nara period. So let us say sixth or seventh century. Um, well, um, this sword um, was it was actually removed from the island by one of the uh, the, um, the, the generals of um, Tokugawa Ieyasu Kuroda Nanamasa who apparently thought better of it and for fear of retribution was, is said to have returned it to the island take a look at it it's a miniature loom for the manufacture of kimono for a deity, and it's made of gilt bronze components fitted together. And take a look at this one. This was made in 1975 for the deity of Issei Shrine. Now the shrine itself at Issei and all the objects which are dedicated to the deity are made every 20 years or so. This means that a young man at the age of 20 could be apprenticed to a man who was 20 years his senior and learn how, over 20 years, how to make the, the, uh, the, the objects or to build the shrine if he was a carpenter. And then he would take over and bring the next apprentice in. So a 60 years cycle it, it, it takes, I think, until you retire or drop off the, uh, 
end, of, the, end, the end of it all. So the point is, is that this is an enduring and ongoing tradition with no end, no, no beginning and no end. This is the essential Japanese aesthetic. And may I introduce you to this, um, the Kudara Kanon figure, greater than life-sized. This is a copy, although I'm told I shouldn't use the word copy. I should use the word bunishin, or a, a representation, or, I think, of this uh, national treasure piece. Well, one of my big brothers in the museum in 1926 um, commissioned this to be made in Japan. Uh, so as it was a national treasure in those days, they decided they'd better have a bit of treasure wood. So um, they took, got, obtained commission, permission to cut a tree from a holy forest. And this shows, the, at the time, the um, uh, a ceremony of blessing, I suppose, their work when the tree was cut down. Uh, and there are uh, the Buddhist and Shinto people in attendance here. And this smiling man here, Mr. Niro Tunosuke, is the man who actually made the sculpture. And I met his grandson in Kyoto. Or his grandson is a restorer of wooden Buddhist images in the uh, National Research Institute there. But to get back to swords, although we haven't really got away from them, to get back to swords, this was made in the early 12th century by some, a, a group, one of a group of smiths who were in regular attendance upon the retired emperor, Gotopa In, who was a sword fanatic. He spent his time with these swordsmiths for 20 years. Um, and this is uh, his swords. He, he actually did the... Um, the heat treating process, which is less physical effort than the, all the hammering and whatnot. Um, and his swords are signed sometimes. You can perhaps just barely see a few lines which are left here of uh, the imperial chrysanthemum. His, his swords, swords are signed with the imperial chrysanthemum. Now, the emperor was described as having an eye like that of a man of the way meaning a man embarked on Buddhist studies. So we know that at least at that time, looking at Japanese swords, the appreciation of the beauty in the sword was akin to some kind of spiritual advancement. Um, I am moving a bit quicker now, I'm afraid. So just go through a few books. So there have always been books describing the um, uh, various facets of a sword. Oh, you can, you can easily see here, can't you? Um, the, the, the so-called the Choji flower, uh, and this is in, in the shape of Mount Fuji. It's a late, later contrived kind of sword. Uh, sea waves here uh, on this side, the so-called Toramba of um, uh, uh, Toramba, yes, of Skenau uh, of Osaka. Um, so it's a kind of um, a, a 17th century user's guide to Japanese swords. In this book. It, we see various kinds of sculpture which are made on the blades of swords, generally showing the religious um, aspirations of the samurai. And this one on the right, if I can draw your attention to this, this is a dragon who's climbing, clambering along the double edges of a, a, a sword with a Vajra hilt. Now, the sword and the dragon represent the attributes of this deity, Fudo Myo, meaning the unmoving or unmovable. The dragon um, representing Fudo's lasso or string here, with which he binds the enemies of Buddhism, and the sword with which he cuts through uh, delusion to ultimate enlightenment. Well, this is the spiritual aspect which the swords, swordsman and the swordsmith aspire to. And this shows uh, the same deity sculpted into the uh, surface of the blade. Now, to make a good sword, then, it is necessary, and it applies to the individual who makes the sword today, as it applies to a whole continuum of swordsmiths over 500 years working to the same end, it is necessary to subjugate the self in order to produce the best that together with the laws of nature, the best work you can. This concept in Japanese is called muga, or selflessness. With this concept of muga, it is possible to obtain wonderful things. 
it's not peculiar to Japan. It, it, it's obviously universal. But with the Japanese sword, we have got so many clues uh, which we can follow in order to, um, to attain that, that concept. The same concept applies in Japanese sword play itself, sword fencing. Uh, if one can attain this position of selflessness so that you are no longer concerned with the matter of winning or losing, your sword play becomes elevated, like that of the great swordsmith Masamune. Masamune didn't impress his self onto the blades. He just wanted to make better and better and better blades. So, briefly then, um, during the Edo period, it's very interesting, it's almost as if the whole of Japan jumped up into a higher gear. And what was a celebration of nature, although it, uh, a very Japanese sort of style of nature, now became a kind of um, a manga of nature, if you like. So, Sukehiro of Osaka now makes a hamon with very, very well-defined billows of the sea. Uh, here's a close-up of, of his blade. It's a wonderful example of the exhibition, which you mustn't miss. Um, the uh, Kanemoto of uh, Gifu Prefecture, of, of Kanemoto of Seke, made swords deliberately um, in the uh, shape of the profile of a conifer forest, the so-called Sambonsugi, a row of three cryptomerias with every third one uh, higher than all the others, and so on. Even on the blades themselves, in the early 17th century, the great smith Yasutsugu, who, with his family, worked throughout the Edo period, or the first hundred and something years or so, at least, for the Tokugawa shogun, uh, put gingerbread on their blades in the form of the uh, bamboo, and on the other side of the blade, the plum, both auspicious um, symbols. And the same applied to the sword mountings. The, this is a standard pair of sword mountings as worn when on official duty by the samurai in Old Edo. And the kind of um, tsuba that you might have had in the early days at least, like this so-called swordsmith tsuba, had a beauty in the rust of the iron itself. The, the beauty in the, the darkness, the degree of blackness, of brownness or blackness uh, of the rust. And the simpleness of this motif, the butterfly here pierced in open work on this deep ground of black, apparently flying out into a void because butterflies were thought to exist somewhere in the heavens and again were, of course, auspicious symbols and used um, universally on Japanese art throughout this um, samurai period. This style uh, changed to this style of decoration, which is no less valid, um, but it, it, uh, it, describe, it describes the so-called Danke epi episode where the hero, Yubi, escaping from his friends. The episode is taken from the Chinese um, Tale of Three Kingdoms. Uh, the only, only way he can escape is to jump into this raging torrent from which no one had ever emerged alive. And this shows the wild uh, determination on his face, and both the fear and acquiescence are on the horse's face. A most beautiful piece of painting on sculpture and yet it's on a, uh, an object which was part of something designed to kill someone. And the final slide I have to show you is certainly by no means the least, because none of this would have any meaning at all unless there had not been, um, f over this period of a thousand years, the gradual development of greater and greater skills of polishing. And we're indeed fortunate today to be able to see this gentleman, Mr. Fujishiro Okisato, uh, showing us how a sword is polished so that we could see the things that I'm afraid you've just been hearing about. That is all. Thank you.